Well, let's turn in the Bible. So James chapter 5. We're going to look at the first six verses here in just a moment. James chapter 5. We're almost done with this series. We've got a few more weeks to go. And then uh, still praying about where we're going to journey next. Either be 1 Thessalonians or Philippians. So you pray for the Lord's wisdom there. Uh, whatever he says is best, and we're going to obey that. But I heard about a pastor who was trying to win this very rich man to the Lord. And the guy was very wealthy, and he had very little concern about God or the things of God. And one day he stopped by the pastor's office, and the pastor said, I want you to come over here, and I want you to look out this window and tell me what you see. So the guy began to describe all the things that he was seeing out there. He said, I see birds flying around. I see beautiful trees. I see kids playing and dogs running around in the park and just a beautiful scene. And he said, now come over here and look in this mirror and tell me what you see when you look in that mirror. The man said, I can only see myself. And the pastor talked to him and he says, the mirror and the window are both made of glass, but the mirror has silver added to it. And when we begin to look at silver and things of the world, we can only see ourselves and it takes the focus off of others and we just see ourselves. Now there's nothing wrong with having money, but listen now, it is wrong if the money has us. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 10 warns us, for the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. Now it doesn't say that the money is the root of all sorts of evil, it says the love of money is is the root of all sorts of evil. And some, by longing for it, in other words, they desire it, they want money, uh, having wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. And we talked about this before, we've got to be careful because sometimes our attitude is, I just want a little bit more. I don't want to be a millionaire, I just want another $50 a week. But then if we had $50 more a week, we say, if only I had another $50 a week, then I could really do something. If only I could get another $100 a week, then I could do something. We want a little bit more, but we're never satisfied as long as we're longing for that money. Now James has already warned us that the heart that steals our affections from God is greed. He said up there in verse 4 that we love the things of the world. We want to become a friend of the world. We become an enemy of God. And he called us spiritual adulteresses. Now listen to this statement by Billy Graham. He said, if a person gets his attitude toward money straightened out, then almost all other areas of his life will be straightened out. Wow! Somebody put it this way, that money talks, I'll not deny, I heard it once, it said goodbye. Hey, in this passage, James is going to show us that money not only uh, speaks once, but twice. It says goodbye when we die, but then on Judgment Day it's going to say hello. So with that sobering thought in mind, let's examine this subject this morning, money talks. Money talks out of James chapter 5, reading the first six verses. Let's stand together all over the building as we honor and reverence the reading of God's perfect word. James chapter 5, starting at verse 1, reading down through verse 6. You follow with me, you'll look up on the screen. The Bible says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries which are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments have become moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver have rusted, and their rust will be a witness against you and will consume your flesh like fire. It is in the last days that you have stored up your treasure. Behold the pay of the laborers who mowed your fields, and which has been withheld by you, cries out against you. And the outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. You have lived luxuriously on the earth and led a life of wanton pleasure. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and put to death the righteous man. He does not resist you. Let's pray together. Father, in Jesus' name, we ask you to speak to us now. Reveal to us what is our money saying about us and about our relationship with you. And Lord, we pray you'd help us to be generous, freely giving always not only here in the church, but out there in the world as we come in contact with others and see various needs. Mindful that we never might like the more like Jesus Christ than when we're given. Speak now and we will obey. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. May be seated. Well, just a few thoughts and we'll say a good deal about each thought. The first thing that James uh, reveals to the 
Church, is their coming troubles. Notice their coming troubles were declared in verse 1. He says, come now. That phrase is meant to grab the reader's attention and it suggests urgency. It'd be like him saying, now look here. Or like when a preacher says, listen up, pay attention. He's already used this verse one other time, and as I mentioned last week, the only other time this phrase is used in the New Testament is also by James, and it's back up there in chapter 4, verse 13, where he says, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we'll do this and that. And so James has warned us twice now about the danger of focusing on money and ignoring God. He says, Come now, you rich. And now before you uh, say, Hey, uh, that's not me. He's talking to millionaires. We need to understand that all of us are rich by the world standards. Now, most of the world today lives in an entire year on less than what we make in one week. So while we don't think, hey, I'm not rich, I'm not driving a, a big car, I don't live in a mansion, uh, we need to understand that James is saying that we are rich by the worldly standards and therefore he is speaking to everybody here today. Now, this passage deals with two main problems concerning their wealth. One was how their wealth was gained, but then the other was how their wealth was used. So James is warning us, be careful how you make your money, and be careful how you use your money as well. Now, James calls on the rich to weep and to howl. These words indicate the frantic terror of those upon whom God's judgment is about to fall. Notice that word weep there in verse 1. It means to sob aloud, to lament, to weep bitterly. It was used of Peter's weeping as he repented of his sin following his denial of Jesus Christ. And so he's saying that you ought to be bitterly broken. You ought to be weeping uncontrollably because of the coming judgment that is upon you. And that word howl means uh, an intense grief. It refers to shrieking or screaming. The reason why they are weeping and howling is because of their coming miseries. That word misery describes overwhelming hardship. It speaks about trouble or suffering or distress. Because they love money more than they love God, James is saying they will suffer. The indication is that their troubles and trials and their judgment was inevitable and inescapable. Nothing they could do about it. It was coming upon them. Well, not only was their troubles declared, but James also goes on to describe them. Look at verse 3. He says, These troubles are going to consume your flesh. It refers to judgment. There was a present judgment in that their decaying coins had decayed their character. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 1 tells us that a good name is to be more desired than great wealth. Favor is better than silver and gold. In other words, to be a person of integrity, to have a good name, is far more important than being rich. Now, it's not the issue of the richness. It's our character and what money can do to us if we don't have a close walk with God. We see a contrast between Abraham and his nephew Lot. Both of them are very wealthy, but we're told in the Bible that Abraham had a very close walk with God. He had a good, strong, daily, quiet time. He loved the Lord, and his, he became rich, but he maintained his faith and his character. Lot, too, became very wealthy and did very well according to the world's standards. But yet he did not have a strong, quiet time. We don't read about him spending a lot of time with God. His character was focused on things of the world, and therefore his character became that which was ruined. Ultimately, it not only ruined him, but it destroyed his family. Well, there's the present judgment. What about the future judgment? In verse 5, he says, You have fattened your hearts as in a day of slaughter. The picture here is of a steer being fed the best to fatten it up for slaughter. When you have cows and cattle, you, you want to make sure that they're as fat as possible, get as much meat as possible on them. And so he said, you're fattening your heart and you're going to become uh, a, a more, more uh, a fatter for the day of the judgment, of slaughter. Now, like the steer, a person who loves money 
focuses only on the present and doesn't think about the coming judgment. As that cow was eating all that food and getting fatter and fatter, he's not thinking to himself that one day I'm going to be led to slaughter. The pig does the same thing. He eats and he eats and he eats and he gets bigger and fatter. But he's not thinking about the judgment to come. And so too is the person who is consumed with the things of this world. All they can think about is getting more. Getting more stuff, a better car, a bigger house, a bigger bank account, more extravagant vacations. And they're focused on all the things of this world and they don't realize that judgment day is fast approaching them. Now James gives three witnesses that will speak out against these individuals on judgment day. He talks about their wealth in verse 2 and 3. He says, your riches have rotted and your garments have become moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver have rusted, and there rust will be a witness against you and will consume your flesh like fire. So he talks about their rotted grain, he talks about their ruined garments, and he talks about their rusted gold. And we'll talk about that in more detail in a minute, so don't worry about if you didn't get that down. But not only was there their wealth that's going to be a judge against them, but also a witness against them on judgment day is their wages. Look at verse 4. It says, Behold the pay of the laborers who mowed your fields, which has been withheld by you, cries out against you, and the outcry has reached the Lord, the, the, uh, the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. So they withheld money from their workers, and that's going to be a, a witness against them on Judgment Day. But then there was also the workers themselves will be a witness against them on Judgment Day. And verse 4 says, The outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. These workers were abused, they were condemned, and they were even murdered. Well, not only does James warn them about their coming troubles, but let's take it a step further. Notice their corrupted treasures. Their corrupted treasures in verses 2 and 3. Their possessions were worthless. Let's take a look further at their possessions and just why they were worthless. He started out with their grain, which was rotted. In verse 2 he says, Your riches have rotted. The word riches, it speaks about uh, their grain. It's, it's their income. It's their possessions. For those in the first century, that was primarily, he's dealing with a, a farming community. It would be all their crops, their grain in this case. Uh, the more grain you had, the more crops you'd have. Uh, and the more crops you have, the more money you had. And so if you had a, a great deal of uh, grain, you had a great deal of wealth. You were rich. It was like having an expanding business. And they would say business was very good. An example of this is the rich farmer in Luke chapter 12 who said he had so much grain that he had to just get bigger and bigger barns to store it all up in. The only problem with that is a storehouse of rotted grain is worthless. What does it do to have all these things if they are rotted? So James is picturing the situation and he's saying, it's not that you have a lot of grain, you have a lot of rotted grain. Nobody wants to buy that. And so what appeared to be a rich man was really actually a very poor man. But not only was their grain rotted, but their garments were ruined. Their garments were ruined. Another indication of just how worthless their possessions were. He said in verse 2, and your garments have become moth-eaten. Now notice that the word garment is plural. Garments. In the first testament, people were very poor. They could only afford one outfit. Hard for us to understand today when we have closets full of clothes. We haven't worn in years. But in the context of the first century, to have more than one outfit was a big deal. It meant you were very rich. So these people had plural uh, garments. And only the rich could afford more than one garment. But just like having an abundance of grain that was rotted is worthless, the same is true if you have an abundance of clothing, but it's all ripped and moth-eaten and torn. And so it's saying you seem like you have a lot, but in reality what you have is useless. So therefore you're not nearly as rich as what may appear to be. But then there was their other treasure that was worth and that was their gold which was rusted and notice he says there in verse 3 he says your gold and your silver have rusted 
Now, he's speaking metaphorically here. Gold doesn't literally rust. The idea is that the money loses value. Uh, some of our senior adults could tell us today that a dollar today does not buy what it used to. Uh, it used to be that you could get the things for a, a few pennies that now cost several dollars. And so the value of the dollar is not nearly as strong as it once was. Uh, we might think we have a lot of money, but when money loses value, it's foolish to put our trust in it. Listen to what Paul told young Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 through 19. He says, Instruct those who are rich in the present world. Now, by the way, remember now the context that we're dealing with, that's everybody in here. We're all rich compared to the rest of the world. So he's not just talking to millionaires. He says, Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches but on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Everything that we have can be taken away very quickly. And so we must make sure that our relationship with God is strong and not put our trust in things. Verse 18, he says, Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. Remember, we've talked about this many times, that we're never more like the Lord Jesus Christ than when we're giving. God was a giver. Ultimately, He gave His life to save us. But He always ministered when He's down here on the earth. When somebody needed an encouraging word, He gave an encouraging word. When He had resources to give them, He gave them resources. And when He could touch them and heal them, or give them a hug, or show some kind of love to them, he gave them whatever they needed. He was a giver, and he demands that his people be givers as well. We should be very, very generous, not just with our money, but with everything, our time, words of encouragement, all of it. But certainly money is a part of that. And if we love the Lord, then we ought to be very, very generous in how we give our money. Because all that we have is going to eventually wear away. And uh, Jesus warned us about Storing up treasures down here on earth or storing up treasures in heaven. He says the wisest investment is put it up there in heaven. If you're a smart person and you have some money to spend, you're going to spend it in an area that's going to give you the greatest return of investment. You don't want to waste that money. And so what Jesus is saying is the greatest return for your investment will be to invest in those things that are eternal. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Y'all all right this morning? People got nervous and start talking about money. Somebody said they're funny about their money and strange about their change. Hey, not only were their possessions worthless, but let's take it a step further. Their possessions were withheld. Look at verse 3. He says, And the rush will be a witness against you and will consume your flesh like fire. It is in the last days that you have stored up your treasure. Wow. With all the hurting and needy people around them, they were hoarding what they had. Now, pack rats don't bless anyone. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 13, Solomon, a pretty wise guy, said, There is a grievous evil which I have seen under the sun. What is it, Solomon? Help us out. Riches being hoarded by their owner to his hurt. Wow! What a shame to see needs around us and then not meet those needs because we're greedy and we take what we have we think it's ours. Now remember, the Bible knows absolutely nothing about ownership. It only speaks about stewardship. God owns it all, and He expects us to be stewards of what He gives us. And so everything that we have, we should understand, God, this belongs to you. My house belongs to you. My car belongs to you. My money belongs to you. My business belongs to you. My very life and my time belong to you. How would you like me to use what you have blessed me with? And how can I invest in others to be a blessing to them and to let the light of the Lord Jesus Christ shine through my life, pointing others to God, who is generous and a very, very uh, sacrificial giver himself. And so he says it's shameful. In fact, John was even more uh, strong than, than uh, Solomon did. And he would say, if you see your brother in need, 
and you have a, a way to meet those needs, how can the love of God abide in you? And the obvious rhetorical answer is, it does not abide in you. You don't have the love of God working in your life if you take what you have and you hoard it rather than investing in others. Now, he doesn't expect us to, to give the same amount of a check in the offering plate or same amount of time. Some people have more energy, some people have more resources, some people have more money, but he does want equal sacrifice. So what we give ought to be sacrificial. It ought to, uh, they say, give until it hurts. Really not a good saying, give until it helps. It ought not to hurt us to give. Y'all all right this morning? I had a pastor buddy of mine put on Facebook. Uh, he, he said that they were uh, some church, I don't know if it was a joke or not, if it was reality, it's hard to tell on Facebook nowadays. But one church was putting the uh, ushers on commission and it said that helped increase their giving. I said, I'll tell you how you increase the giving. You let the little kids take up the offering. And you know what they're going to do? They're going to stop at every single person. And if you don't put something in the plate, they're going to call you out on it. At least a five-year-old to take up the offering. We, we don't put the... Uh, Offering plates here, thankfully. I was at one church. They used to leave them up here until after the service. And I told them, get, get that offering plate out of here. I was tired of looking at $1 bills in the offering plate. And we had a children's church. There was no kids in there. So that was a dose putting dollar bills in there. And I said, nobody in this church made $10 this past week. Remember now, 10% is training wheels. We've got to eventually take off the training wheels and start giving more. Amen, preacher. God bless you for preaching the word. Hey, listen to what Warren Wiersbe said. He said, what we keep, we lose. And what we give to God, we keep. And he adds interest to it. Wow. Remember, we're talking about making an investment that's worthwhile. I don't want to just throw my money away. I want to invest it in that which is going to give me a good return. And he says, give it to God. And he'll increase it more than what anything else you could ever possibly do with it. The stock market is going to fall apart. Uh, we can spend money on possessions and all that stuff James already showed us. that It rusts and it rots and it falls apart. But if we give it to God, He'll make a good investment with it. And now, we examine our house. We can find food. We can find clothes. We can find furniture. We can find all kinds of things in our houses that we can turn around and bless somebody else and invest it in somebody else's life. But you know what we do? We just stuff it in that closet. We push it off to the side. We've got clothes in there we haven't worn in years. We've got shoes, ladies, haven't worn in years. We've got all kinds of stuff out in the shed, guys, haven't used it in years. And what we could do is take it out of there, turn around and give it to somebody else, and invest in somebody else's life. Wow! That's what we ought to do. That's what Jesus would do. The good news is you can't take it with you, so you might as well give it to somebody before your kids waste it. Hey, I'm having fun if nobody else is. Somebody said, you've gone to meddling preaching. No, no, you know what that is? That's called preaching with application. All right, that's one thing to talk about James and his buddies. What has it got to do with me, my life, James? Help me out. Listen to what Jimmy Draper said, pre former president of Lifeway. He said, God never intended anything he gave us to be wasted, either by abuse, misuse, or lack of use. Everything he gave, he gave to be used. Wow! Every dollar you have in your pocket, God gave it to you to use it, and use it wisely. Every second of your life, God gave it to you to be used wisely. And we talked about it in Sunday school this morning, how Jesus says, time is running out. Take the opportunities that you have. Take advantage of those opportunities. Invest in others while you have the opportunity right now. We, we mentioned it last week. James warned us about the frailty of life. Just this past week, we had another tragic and senseless shooting in a school. Uh, these young children going to school. Thought they had their whole life ahead of them. Looking forward to graduation and moving on with life. And now their life is over. We never know when our time is up. We never know, know when these opportunities are going to pass us by. And once they're gone, they're gone forever. It's too late to invest in those ten kids now. Should have been done before. 
And God is saying, I'm giving you opportunities, I'm giving you resources. Don't hoard it up, use it to build the kingdom of God. Listen, God has not called the church to build a bank account. God's called us to build the kingdom. We must take everything we have and say, God, how can we use this to build your kingdom? Take my very life and all of my time and let me use it wisely in investing in others. Just imagine if we didn't have Facebook, if we didn't have a TV, how much we could do without wasting our time watching TV shows and football games and going on Facebook and checking out all the drama. Keep the dirty laundry in your laundry room. And save the drama for your mama. Hey, we'd be wise to follow the advice of the Lord Jesus Christ when he warned us in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 to 21. Do not store for yourselves treasures on earth. Why not, Jesus? Because moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, listen to this now, there your heart will be also. Wow. So how do, how do you know what's important to somebody? Check the checkbook. Look at how they spend their money, and then you'll know what's important to them. Look at how they spend their free time when they're not working, and they have nothing to do. What do they do with their free time? That's what's important to them. Where does their mind wander to when they're daydreaming? That's what's important to them. And so Jesus says, I don't know where your heart is because where your treasure is, that's where your heart is, whether it's up there or whether it's down here. Now, a lot of folks are, are so earthly minded, they're no heavenly good whatsoever. We say, Pastor John, help me out. How do I store up treasures in heaven and make that good investment? By investing in those things that build God's kingdom. What are we doing when we take up that offering every week? What we're doing is we're taking up the money, not just to pay the light bill, but part of that money we tithe as a church, just like you tithe as an individual. And so we're tithing, and by the way, just like I said, 10% is training wheels, we're giving beyond 10% as a church. And so we're investing in others. We've got uh, different ministries around town that we're supporting and investing in, but then we also got missionaries around the world that we're supporting through the Southern Baptist Cooperative Program. I told you that we have vacation Bible school coming up. We're praying for at least 80 kids to come in. We want to make an investment in those 80 kids. And so we're taking up school supplies. There's a list out there. If you haven't given yet, you need to grab that list today and say, God, help me to be generous and invest my time and money in getting this stuff so I can invest in these children, many of them who, whose parents cannot buy them the needs, the stuff that they need for school. We did the same thing last Christmas. We had... Uh, the shoe box that we gave out around the world. Uh, a simple shoe box that didn't cost a few dollars to fill and some child around the world was excited to get that. We may never see that person uh, this side of glory, but we know that we'll make an investment in them and God says that's a good investment. That's a good place to spend your money. Right there. Because they also receive the gospel as well as those, those toys and gifts. Wouldn't it be awesome in your sanctified imagination, as you're investing in others and you're supporting missionaries around the world and you're, you're giving to the shoebox and you're helping out and most of the time we don't have a clue where the money's going. It's just going here and there and God's using it He desires. But in the, on the other side, in heaven, be thanked by a stranger and say, well, because of you, I'm here today. Thank you for sending that shoebox uh, around the world. Because you gave that shoebox, I heard the gospel and I got saved. Because you supported that mis min uh, missionary around the world through your cooperative program, I heard the gospel and I got saved and now I'm here today because you put some money in the offering plate over in that little tiny church in Eustace, Florida. Wow! But look what he said there in verse 3. He said it's in the last days that they were doing all these things. It's a tragedy to miss out on an opportunity. And when it's gone, it's gone forever. If you missed Sunday school this morning, get with somebody who was there and ask them what we talked about. And Jane, Jesus said that time was running out. He had only four months left. He healed a blind guy in John chapter 9. He had about four months left in his ministry. And he says, while I'm here, I'm the light of the world, but I'm going to, have to after a while, turn over to you, and you're going to have to become the light of the world. And he said that time is running out. And we've got to glorify God and do all we can to invest in others while we have this time on this earth. And we've got to say, God, we're wasting opportunities, squandering 
the opportunities that God has given us because we're too focused on other things. And James is saying, you better check yourself because judgment day is coming and it will not be pleasant for the church. The Bible says that judgment is going to begin with the house of God. And I think the church in America is in a lot of trouble. Well, not only do we see there coming troubles in the corrupted treasures, but let's move on. What about their cruel tactics? Their cruel tactics. And James showed us that their tactics were very cruel in a few different ways. First of all, seeing their stealing. Look at verse 4. He said, Behold the pay of the laborers who mowed your fields, which has been withheld by you. Now they did the work, but they didn't get paid for it. They mowed the fields, they did the harvesting, but they didn't receive their wages. They stole from these day laborers by withholding their pay. Now remember the context, we still have some day laborers around today, but most people get a job and they stay there. Uh, but there's still some day laborers today. And the same was true back then. These people would look for work. A farmer would come along and say, hey, you three come with me, I got some work for you to do. And he put these people to work. And they did the work, James says, but they didn't get to pay for what they did. Now these were Jews he's speaking to primarily. They knew what the Word of God said. Leviticus 19.13 says, You shall not oppress your neighbor nor rob him. The wages of a hired man are not to remain with you all night until morning. They had a responsibility at the very end of the day. When that person finished up the work and the sun went down and said, Okay, the work day's over, they would give them the, the pay right then and there. Most of us today are paid weekly or bi-weekly, but when that payday comes, it is a boss's responsibility to make sure you got that paycheck in your hands. And he says, don't you let that, that, that sun go down and you tell the guy, hey, I'll pay you tomorrow. You pay him today, the Bible says. What, what does that mean for us? Because some of us here are business owners, but not many. What he's saying is, if you're a business owner, you've got a responsibility to pay your workers. Pay them fairly, pay them generously, give them bonuses when it's appropriate and business is good, and make sure that your checks don't bounce. I had a guy one time I was working for, up north, he's a landscaper, and his checks would always bounce. So I finally told him, I said, listen, buddy, you're going to go down to the bank with me, and you're going to cast this check, or I'm going to find another job. And I said, all these other guys might have to deal with that, because a lot of them were in jail, they had no license, they were on drugs, they couldn't get a job anywhere. I said, but that's not going to fly with me, so you make sure I work hard all week, I do exactly what you tell me to do, and when a week comes, that paycheck better cash. And he had constant problems because he mismanaged his business, uh, and he was himself on drugs and everything. I didn't stay long in that job, but that's another story. But we must make sure that our workers get paid and that we honor what we say we're going to do. But what about the rest of us that don't have a business? When you have a bill and that bill is due, pay it. Pay it on time, every time. When we don't pay our bills, we look like a deadbeat and we give a bad name to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a disgrace and a shame for a Christian to let those due dates go by and then say, well, i got a few extra days. You know, it says it's due on the first, but they give you about a grace period of four or five days. In emergency, God understands. Very, very seldom that should ever happen. But if we manage our money properly, when that bill comes in, pay it. Uh, when I get mine at the beginning of the month, I don't care if it's due on the 22nd, I say, let's go ahead and pay them all right away. I'd rather pay early uh, than to pay late. I don't want anybody to owe me anything. I'd rather be the other way around. I mean, for them to, uh, not for me to owe them, but for them to owe me. I don't want to ever be in debt to anybody, uh, whatever I have. And so if you've got bills, pay them. Filing bankruptcy is a disgrace to the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what Proverbs chapter 3, verse 27 and 28 says. It says, do not withhold good from those to whom it is due. When you owe somebody something, give it to them. Uh, when it is in your power to do it. He understands that emergencies arise, things come up, you just can't help it. Uh, but that's again very rare case he says do not say to your neighbor go and come back tomorrow and I will give it when you have it with you he said if you don't have it until tomorrow give it to him tomorrow as soon as you get it give it to him but if you have it now don't tell him go home and come back later give it to him now don't just put off bills because you want to go out and spend money at the restaurant and in the movie theater and spend all your money on entertainment and then say now I can't pay my light bill pay the bills when they come in if we manage our money properly, we would do a lot better than what we do. Now, greed makes us withhold our money. An example of that is Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5. They were asked a question. 
Okay, you sold the land. It's your money. Do what you want to do with it. Uh, you want to give a, an offering above and beyond your tithes to the church? We're glad to take your money. We've got some needs around here that want to invest in other people that were hurting. But then Peter asked him the question, is this the amount that you sold it for? Uh, the Holy Spirit had revealed some things to him. Well, Ananias lied about it and said, yeah, that's, that's the amount. And James said, you, you, I mean, are you sure you don't want to change that story? Peter told him. And he said, nope, that's what we made. Okay, guess what? You lied. Not to the preacher, you lied to God. And the Holy Spirit struck him down right then and there. Then his wife came in a little while later, still carrying his body out. And they asked him, and he asked her the same question. How much did you sell that land for? Are you sure that's the amount? You want to change your story while you got a chance? No, that's the amount. Well, guess what? You're going the same way your husband went, and there he goes, and you're going right there behind with him. Wow. <laughs> hey, aren't you glad God doesn't do it like that today? But listen now, don't think that God has somehow become soft and weak over the years. Uh, just because he doesn't give that kind of punishment immediately right now does not mean the punishment is not coming. James is saying, your punishment's coming. It's inevitable, it's inescapable, it's going to happen. Wow. So God knows. And it's because of greed that we say we want to do all these things. It's amazing how folks say, well, I can't tithe, but yet they have plenty of money uh, to go out to entertainment. Well, their cruel tactics are seen in their stealing, but also by their selfishness. Notice their selfishness in verse 5. He says, you have lived luxuriously on the earth. Uh, they're doing just fine. Got a nice house, got lots of food on the table. And they had a life of wanton pleasure. Wow. You have fattened up your hearts in a day of slaughter. They lived a good life at the expense of others. Now remember, the reason why they're so rich is because they took the money that should have belonged to somebody else and they kept it. Luke chapter 12, verse 15 says, Then he said to them, Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possession. Wow. And then Jesus warned us very soberingly in Matthew chapter 16, verse 26. He asked a very important question. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? What good is it if you could have all the money of the world? If you could have everything your heart ever desired, uh, the, the best car you could ever want to get, the best house you could ever want to get, vacation homes around the world, what good is it to have everything that your heart desires and yet you don't have a relationship with God, you're not storing up any treasure on the other side, and you don't know the Lord and you forfeit your own soul. Wow. Hey, that's a cost that is far too high. And we may not take it serious down this side, but on the other side, we're going to say, I wish I had taken that a little bit more serious. Well, finally, their cruel tatters are seen in their suing. Notice their suing there in verse 6. <clears throat> he says, You have condemned and put to death the righteous man. He does not resist you. And that word condemned is a legal term. It means to render a verdict in a court of law. What the rich did was just like they do today. They used the courts to imprison the poor for not paying their bills. Well, wait a minute. Why couldn't they pay their bills? Because their paycheck was withheld from them. How are you going to pay the bill when the boss don't pay you? So it was their fault for them not paying the bills. And yet they would turn around and sue the guy for not paying his bills. And all the while they had the money in their hand to begin with. It was their fault. And yet they sued the others. It's amazing. All the different lawyers that we have out there. I mean, you drive all over Orlando, you see them, signs everywhere. Dan Newman got me all this money. I called John Morgan, he got me all this money. And you see all these people talking about all the money they got. And everywhere you look, there's a lawyer everywhere. And they're always wanting to sue somebody. You get into a car accident, somehow or another, they find that you got in a car accident, they start sending you letters. Hey, would you like to sue that guy? Call me up and we'll take care of him. Wow. So it says there that they put this man to death. The poor starved to death. They, they couldn't even afford to buy food. And they were locked up in prison. And it wasn't like these vacation home prisons we have today. They did a really hard time. And then it says, he does not resist you. Like many people today, they could not afford a lawyer to, uh, to help them out. 
And so James says that these rich people who were taking these other people to court because they withheld their pay and they were causing to be in these trials, he says, God is going to judge you. They have a judge on the other side that's going to step in on their behalf. Well, as we've clearly seen, money does indeed talk. The question is this morning, what is your money saying about you? What does it say about your relationship with the Lord? Uh, are you a generous giver? You know, I've never known in any church that I was in what anybody gave. I've always made that a principle. I did not want to know. If anybody ever comes to me and says, Hey, could you put this in the offer plate? I forgot. I said, Don't give it to me. I don't touch the money. Billy Graham taught me females and finances get you in trouble. So I don't hang out with the ladies alone and I don't touch the money. It's just, uh, you got to stay focused. It worked for him for uh, over 50 years of ministry. I think I'll go with his pattern. But I don't know what anybody gives. Don't care, don't want to know. I know what I give and nobody else. And so I just throw it out there. If you are comforted by what you give, then you're good to go. If the Holy Spirit convicts you, then talk to Him about it. But what does your money and how you spend your money say about your relationship with God? Are you a generous giver? Have you gone above and beyond? You know, you really can't even call yourself a giver unless you give more than 10%. A 10% is a tithe, and that's, God expects that back. It's kind of like you borrowed it from Him and you're just giving it back to Him. If I was to say, well, thank you for letting me borrow your car, and then I gave it back to you. Now, aren't you excited I gave that car back? I gave you a car. You say, you didn't give me anything. You just simply gave back to me what was already mine. And so we can't say, God, I'm a giver, if we're not giving beyond 10%. That's training wheels. You've got to start out there, but the church has got to eventually get beyond that stuff. But not only money, but what about your use of your spiritual gifts? Are you a good and faithful steward? Uh, with the spiritual gift that God's given you? Are you serving in the church? Uh, are you exercising that spiritual gift or have you stored that up and wasted it? You know, Peter tells us that the gifts that God gives us is not for our benefit, but to invest in others. And so why do we use that gift? We give it because we want to invest in somebody else. And so are you using your gift to invest in others? We are in desperate need of faithful workers. We need more workers in the nursery, we started out strong, but many have wandered away from their post in the nursery. We need to get back in there. We need nursery workers. We need children's church workers. We've got vacation Bible school coming up. We need folks to step up to the plate and start teaching and investing in these kids and helping them out uh, in, in uh, vacation Bible school. We need people to help out in the kitchen to work with uh, bringing in meals. Uh, Linda takes care of that. So you've got a sign-up sheet. If you've not already signed up, get, get in there and get, find out when you can bring. When the next opportunity to give a breakfast. Uh, or to give uh, a lunch on Wednesday nights. Uh, lots and lots and lots of ministries that need to be done. Uh, what are you doing with your spiritual gifts? And then what are you doing with your time? Are you storing up gifts and treasures in heaven by the proper use of your time, like the Lord Jesus Christ, living in the light of eternity? Or are we just squandering and wasting our time? Uh, once the opportunities are gone, they're gone forever. And so my job is to get you ready for Judgment Day. Just as James was saying, I'm trying to get you ready for Judgment Day. So it's up to you to get along with God and say, God, how am I using and investing in my spiritual gifts, my treasures, my time, my talents, everything? And then let God worry about it. All right, let's stand for prayer. Our praise team is coming. We have an invitation picked out. The altar is going to be wide open. God has been moving in people's hearts uh, here the last few weeks. The altar has been overflowing. And I would encourage you today to come to the altar. Uh, maybe you don't normally use the altar, but today would be a good day to do that. Uh, maybe you say, you know what, I, I can't really get down on my knees down there at the altar. Uh, you can do like some do and just come down and stand at the altar. You say, why do I got to go down the altar? Why can't I just stand right here and pray? Uh, you don't have to. Uh, but it just sets a tone that you want to come and talk to God and get alone with God and just focus on Him and nothing else around you. So I would encourage you to come to the altar and say, God, how am I using my money, my time, my talents that you have given me? I'm not an owner of anything. God, you own it all. Uh, and I'm just to be a good steward of what you give me, even my very life. Let's pray, then the altar is wide open. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you that your word warns us and speaks to us in every area of our life. And Lord, thank you for these warnings that we might get right with you before it's too late. And Father, I pray that you would speak to each individual here. Uh, Lord, I know we have some hard workers, and some faithful and generous and sacrificial givers. But, Lord, you know every person's heart. You know what they are doing and what they could be doing. 
And so, Lord, I pray that those who are giving and those who are faithful and those who are workers will be encouraged, will continue to do more. And, Father, I pray for those who have not yet uh, embraced the uh, idea and the desire uh, to give uh, and to serve. Lord, I pray you'd help them to get on board with the rest of us. And, Father, we pray that you would change every heart in here today. Lord, help us remember the time is running out and Judgment Day is fast approaching us. Prepare us for that day, we pray in Jesus' name.